The Courtship of Hector MacLean by William Allen Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Part One. The night clouds are falling, the curlew is calling, Maid of Dunnelly, I come unto thee. The grey mists are sleeping on Cruach and Ben, The red deer are keeping their watch in the glen. Light of my darkness, come, come unto me. Come, gentle spirit, we part, and forever. Come, my lone star, see, my skiff's in the bay. Sunbeam of morning, alas, we must sever. Maid of Dunnelly, we part, and for a. The past I shall cherish, my love cannot perish. Maid of Dunnelly, oh, why did we love? The wrath of thy father is winter's cold breath. Around me fast gather weird visions of death. Soul of my dreamings, thy home is above. Come, drooping floweret, I've dared thy brave kinsman. Come, lonely dove, to thy warrior true. Shadow of heaven and pride of thy clansmen, my heart goes to thee in my lingering adieu. Ere died the echoes of the lay, an oar song swept across the bay. Ere turned the youth his skiff to reach, swift footsteps ran along the beach. Before him came MacDougall's dread, returning from an island raid. Behind him came MacDougall's wild, aroused to guard their chieftain's child. Their startling yells of rage were flung, and back from grey Dunley rung, the oarsmen heard the well-known cry, and fiercer far pealed their reply. Their stalwart arms out sternward went, their lithe backs forward lowly bent, to simultaneous motion prone, their oars arose and fell as one. Impelled with danger's vigor new, swift o'er the bay each galley flew like arrows, shot from full-drawn bows. On sped the billow-cleaving prows, till driven on the shingle nigh, the oaken keels arose on high. With sudden bound unto the shore each clansman leapt with drawn claymore. Bare-armed, unbonneted, they ran to join the members of their clan, ranged round a stalwart youth who stood bold-fronted mid the savage brood. At every point the thirsty brands around him flashed in angry hands with eagle eye, and undismayed the stranger drew his trusty blade, and tighter grasped his studded shield, and firmer stood upon the field, as watchful as a wolf at bay. His lightning eye mid them survey, nor quailed, nor flinched, though well he saw the gathering horde still closer draw. No coward heart within him beat, nor sought he safety in retreat. Unequal though the contest seemed, defiance on his features gleamed. One hurried glance he flung above, where dwelt the maiden of his love. A pale face from a window peered, a sigh upon the wind careered, a whisper trembled in the air as if an angel breathed a prayer. Undaunted all and scorning death, he faced his foes and held his breath with back against King Fingal's rock. He boldly met their onset shock and flung his haughty looks of scorn upon MacDougall, chief of Lorne. Part Two, O Isles of the West, lovely Isles of the West, as emerald set in the blue ocean's breast, the birthplace of clansmen war nurtured and brave, the home where the tempest king rides on the wave, where thunders roll on in their terrible might, and keen lightnings dance on each peak with delight. Where morning's dawn raids o'er the mountain crests run, And gloaming descends as a sigh from the sun, Where pale ghosts career on the mist-shrouded hills, And heard are their wails and the songs of the rills, Where beauty is shrined in each lone grassy vale, And we flowerets laugh to the voice of the gale. Where unfettered peace as a heaven presides, And nature's sweet loveliness ever abides, Where maidens and youths round their dim cottage fires Exultingly tell of the deeds of their sires, Or sing with emotion the grand battle lays Of heroes who fought in the faraway days For king and for chieftain, for honor and love, For aught that would valor or dignity prove. O isles of the west, ever bosomed in song, My highland harp whispers, the sound I'll prolong. Speak on, my dear harp, list, it trembles again, Its theme the MacDougall and dauntless MacLean. The sun rays had fled from the mountains of Lorne, And kissed the cloud peaks looming jagged and riven, That westward were trailing as wanderers forlorn Upon the broad heaths of the night-tented heaven. Peace clothed the green valleys, the hills, and the isles. The strange sounds of silence seem wondrously clear. 
unbroken save when with his chase-laden spoils arose the loud shout of a brave mountaineer which woke the weird echoes of quarry and cave and startled the lord of the clouds in his dreams who raised his proud head and defiantly gave his fierce challenge back in his shrill sounding screams the distant bell-notes slowly rung from lismore and fluttered with joy o'er the fast ebbing tide which bore them with love unto morven's far shore where midst its blue mountains they whispered and died sweet o'er the dark waters the vesper hymn stole in cadences kissed by the gloaming soft breath monks poured their orisons with joy dwelling soul and hied to their cells in the fullness of faith who knelt with the abbot who joined in his prayer whose voice in devotion fell soft as a sigh MacDougall's fair daughter was worshipping there. MacDougall's fair daughter was heard in reply. Why lingered she thus as the sun rays depart? Dunley was far, and the dark sea her path. What wrecked she? She bore in her bosom a heart that feared not the swift rushing tide in its wrath. A child of the forest, a child of the chase, accustomed to danger, to hardship inured, descended from chiefs of a warrior race whose titles and acres were held by the sword the blood of the valiant flowed pure in her veins she loved to behold the brave clansmen in arms the bright flashing steel and the pibroch's wild strains gave light to her dark eyes and grace to her charms though nurtured mid war's stirring clangor and din her heart was a woman's in all which endears the fountain of tenderness welling within for children had smiles for the dying had tears her dark flowing locks hung unfettered and free and waved in the wind as a banner love driven her brow gently kissed by the sun in his glee reflected the beauty of summer fraught heaven her eyebrows as fringes of darkness arose in soft glossy silkiness fading to naught while neath their love shadows in tender repose her dreamy eyes rippled in soul light of thought which brightly illumined her features and lent ineffable witchery to the sweet smiles oft throned on her lips with a gracefulness meant to beautify nature's pure innocent wiles in symmetry faultless in tartan arrayed she moved as a sylph in her artless attire when heard were the songs of Dunley's fair maid, the clansmen wept great tears of grief, joy, or ire. The gray-headed abbot stalked down to the shore and blessed the young maiden and bade her adieu. She launched her light skiff, waved her hand, seized the oar, then off with the tide for Dunley she flew. Part Three. Away and away, with the speed of the wind, each headland, each creek, and each cranny she knew. Lismore's verdant island was left far behind, and distant Dunley loomed darkly in view. The tide rush of Etive she battled with might. Twas vain, to the westward she swiftly was hurled. Strong eddies wild sweeping hissed hoarse with delight, as oft her frail skiff in their vortex was whirled. Undaunted and tireless she pulled at the oars, undaunted and fearless the breaker's deep song she heard mid Carrera's wild treacherous shores but watchful and wary she darted along she saw with dismay that dunley she passed she saw its dark tower swiftly gliding astern as gloaming gave place to night's darkness at last the landmarks erst known she could dimly discern the lone herald star of the evening appeared in pale silvern modesty's beauty serene while down in the east o'er the cloud edges peered the halo that ushered night's full beaming queen then leapt every star from its holy repose as chorister sweet in the heavens above their bright joyous anthems of glory arose in soft trembling beauty in homage of love on on and still on to the westward she sped and cold dawning fear tilled her bosom with awe that awe which unnerves us and fills us with dread and makes us poor slaves to its pitiless law the night mist descended from lofty Ben Moor and rolled as a cloud on the breast of the deep. Weird sounds rose anon, now behind, now before, and floating seagulls wildly screamed in their sleep. The conflict of currents hissed loud to the skies and heightened the waves that in anger arose around her frail skiff, their wan, death gleaming eyes oft peered at the maiden and laughed at her woes the terror of death filled her soul with despair she trembled and wept as a motherless child 
she gazed to the heavens she shrieked a heart prayer in accents of agony fearfully wild hark hark o'er the deep came a sound could it be her prayer was answered that succor was nigh the harsh creak of oars on the mist-laden sea came nearer came clearer and filled her with joy a voice from the darkness was heard she replied the moment seemed hours that would ne'er have an end she marked through the mist a boat's faint shadow glide and heard the hallo of a fast nearing friend invisible hands flung unerring a rope its swift gliding folds seemed the answer she craved twas clutched with the frenzy of fast dying hope and consciousness fled as the maiden was saved MacDougall's grim chieftain was restless this night he stood on his ramparts he watched and he mourned his henchmen and clansmen with fleet-footed might had sought her afar but despairing returned they sought her in chamber they sought her in cot they searched etive shore they scoured valley and heath their slogan pealed far but an answer came not and filled was each breast with forebodings of death MacDougall's grim chieftain stalked through his lone halls despair's moody silence o'ershadowed his face the voice of the night wind in ominous calls seemed chanting a dirge for the doom of his race he started he wept then he laughed then he scowled then sullenly motionless stood on the floor and quivered with terror as dismally howled the staghound that kept his night watch at the door mysterious footsteps he heard as they moved strange beings appeared but to vanish again ah little he knew that the daughter he loved was safe in the halls of his foe the maclean part four there was a time a long long time ago when duart's halls resounded to the flow of minstrel harmony of dance and song of mirth and glee from clansmen old and young when Duart's chief could muster at his word a thousand doughty champions of the sword, a thousand plaided men whose only faith was, love the chief and fear no foe or death. No other aspirations filled them then, save to be reckoned as heroic men. Their hearts were fraught with burning warlike zeal, their frames were iron and their sinews steel. On simple fare as hardy men they grew, nor luxuries effeminacy knew, their cots and fields were theirs, rude comfort reigned. They felt not want, and healthful years maintained. They loved their chief for honor and for name, and freely shed their blood to guard his fame. The chief loved them with patriarchal care, knew all their sorrows, heard each plaint or prayer. And as a father mid his children dear, he lived beloved and honored without fear untainted thus with no ambition's pride in nature's happiness they lived and died see duart now its shapeless ruins gloom in the sad grandeur of a shivered tomb time's silent chisels have fell havoc spread a wreck is here cold desolate and dead the moaning sea around the headland sweeps and o'er the rocks in fretful surges leaps or wanders mournfully around the bay where off the black proud oaken galleys lay the eerie wind within the ruin raves and shrilly whistles o'er the warriors graves the grass is bent neath the uncertain blast as nature's mourners for a glorious past no sound is heard no wandering footsteps seen decay's weird silence lords it o'er the scene the night bats dart from out the chinky walls and ghostly owlets own the roofless halls the gloomy spirits of a valiant race seem stalking ever round the lonely place or neath the full moon's wan unearthly light seem mustering us of yore for raid or fight unto the mournful pibroch of the wind that dies and leaves a deeper hush behind twas here the hector of my tale drew his first breath and poured his infant wail here his young lips drew with a lover's zest his future valor from his mother's breast here his young eyes beheld with fond delight the shining steely panoply of fight his chubby hands oft vigorously essayed to lift with shouts the old paternal blade a dirk and shield were his infantile toys their rattling din the source of childish joys the ancient dame endowed with second sight foretold his future as a chief of might 
the hoary bards would on him wondering gaze and croon to him their stirring battle lays the smiling clansmen would with loving scan applaud the annex that bespoke the man and gathering round their fair-haired future lord they taught him early how to wield a sword and bend a bow with steady hand and eye until the shafts would all unerring fly to scale the rugged heights devoid of fear and track with wary steps the watchful deer to pull an oar or tend a shortened sail when burst the fury of a sudden gale beneath tuition such as this he grew skilled in the various arts that clansmen knew till daring hector stood unmatched at length for feats of arms agility and strength the wolf that roamed the shores of galadu he tracked unto his lair and singly slew he fought the eagle on the giddy crest and conquering bore the eaglets from their nest the prowling foe on sudden nightly raid was vanquished off beneath his foremost blade in skirmishes upon the mainland shore his skilful prowess oft the victory bore his doughty deeds were whispered far and wide and bards and maidens sang of them with pride till mid the isles his warlike name was spread and foemen feared the men by hector led proud was the father of his chief-like boy the gentle mother's only hope and joy his well-knit frame of perfect manly mould at once the leader and the warrior told a calm determination lit his face and gave his mien an all-commanding grace in judgment cool in wary caution skilled his looks and gestures confidence instilled his eye in peace beamed with a kindly glow but fiercely flashed when told a tale of woe the heart that beat within his tartan breast was swift to help the weak or the oppressed untouched as yet by love's absorbing flame it felt not aught save the parental claim as mid his clansmen's homes he freely roved the maidens gazed and as they gazed they loved thus hector lived and spent his youthful years a lordly prince among his mountaineers by all who knew him loved adored revered by every foeman in encounter feared not so his hereditary foe MacDougall's chief who longed his hate to show incensed to hear of hector's rising fame his breast was filled with jealousy and shame long in the west as lorne's unconquered lord he awed the chieftains by his cruel sword in raid or foray or in deeds of blood his wild and lawless clan the foremost stood nor could he brook to know some chiefs had sued alliance with the clan he had subdued to guard his power which seemed upon the wane his dark heart planned a conflict with MacLean. part five the full-browed moon leapt from her shrouds leaving behind the darkening clouds and flung o'er mountains hills and braes the softening splendour of her rays o'er cruachan ben they nimbly crept on dark loch awe they gently slept and westward far she sent her smiles till silver bathed appeared the isles the moon was up then wide and far arose MacDougall's cry of war from etive shore from sweet banal to kill Ninver and Grey Kintrow. It wildly pealed on Avich's side, Dalmali and Kilchurn replied, and gloomy Brander's echoes run as speedy clansmen rushed along through tangled brake or stretching heath, and poured their startling cry of death which summoned from each distant cot the clansmen to the mustering spot. Ere reached the moon her halfway mark from mountainside, from gorges dark, from heath, from hill, from every glen rushed forth full armed stout plaided men whose distant forms were oft revealed as flashed the moonbeams on each shield obedient to the call they flew nor aught of toil or fear they knew as singly some careened along they lowly hummed a battle song the distance lessening neath the lay which cheered them on their lonely way till on dunley's tower they gazed upon whose northern walls still blazed the beacons fitful lurid light betokening danger foes or fight around the walls were gathered then two hundred of MacDougall's men wild unkempt shaggy warriors grim broad-chested strong in arm and limb from youth to ceaseless warfare trained a terror far their names remained before their chief in armed array the horde stood ready for the fray swift to the galley swift he cried we must away ere falls the tide ten oaken broad-beamed galleys lay rocked with the tide in oban's bay 
now from their moorings soon they danced as oars upon the waters glanced and neath their chieftain's eye and word the clansmen nimbly sprang on board four brawny arms seized every oar and soon the fast receding shore was left behind and fainter grew as past carrera's isle they flew MacDougall led the course was west in whispers low his clansmen guessed that ere the morning sun arose their swords would smite some island foes as huntsmen steal with caution near the browsing unsuspecting deer as wildcats crouch and trailing creep before they make their deadly leap as eagles circle in the sky ere on their prey they downward fly so stealthily the waters o'er MacDougall neared the hazy shore where Duart's keep hushed in repose in frowning grandeur looming rose calm standing on his galley's prow with anxious glass and cloudy brow the chieftain led the dubious way and sought the sheltered western bay whose shelving shore gave footing meet for landing or for safe retreat though steering in the hazy band which hugged the confines of the land he cleared the rocks that girt the shores and duart passed with muffled oars ah what he not the warder there skilled in the night sounds of the air had heard with ready well-trained ear or echo softly stealing near which all too measured faint and slow betokened some advancing foe quick from the ramparts quick he sped and roused young hector from his bed up hector up a foe is near their galleys neath the walls appear arm arm they seek the bay their coming brooks of no delay up from his couch bold hector leapt and o'er his startled countenance crept a smile of joy which seemed to show his readiness to meet the foe. Wake, Malcolm, our retainers all, who slumber in the banquet hall. Then speed thee on, ere dawns the day, to Auchincross, and Taurus say, Away, away, rouse every man who owes allegiance to our clan. With lightning footsteps tireless go, we must and shall repel this foe. Devoid of bonnet, hose, or plaid, he snatched his shield and glittering blade with eye that flashed red battle-fire and step that told of rising ire with lips compressed till void of blood he sought the hall where ready stood scarce thirty stalwart clansmen leal whose hearts and arms were like their steel no sound no word men follow me a foe comes on us from the sea the lark pipes now its morning strains come on it rouses the maclean's part six the morn was calm Bright in the east, afar as a lone sentinel, the morning star glimmered its welcomes in the deep-hued blue. As o'er the high bank clouds the monarch threw his sceptre gleams of living, glowing gold, which vanquished night, and, space illuming, rolled in all the grandeur of a conqueror's might, whose path is victory, whose throne is light. The sullen shadows fled from mountain crests, and scowling sought the gorges in their breasts their lingering footsteps in the trailing mist the airy smiles of light with fondness kissed till grandly lone with broad uncovered brows as hoary worshippers each mountain rose the wonder chorus of each stream was heard and joyous trillings rose from every bird adown each glen the messengers of dawn danced merrily o'er forest heath and lawn swift o'er the heaving bosom of the sea they lightly flew with love-inspiring glee and kissed the pale lips of the wavelets cold till gleamed their foam flowers with the hues of gold they wooed the haze that wrapped the slumbering isles which gently rose beneath their chastening wiles but ere it faded from the shores away the sounds of battle burst in duart's bay MacDougall led the van and well had steered into the bay where on each side appeared brown sea-washed rocks whose unseen stretching arms broke the wild fury of the northern storms thus guarded from the ocean's wildest rage it gave a safe and sheltered anchorage his ready henchman with inverted spear probed the still depths and found the shore was near then passed a whispered signal to each crew to right and left the boats in order drew with silent skill the oars were placed on board and every clansman seized his shield and sword in line abreast the galleys forward went as from the stern they shoreward swift were sent no word was uttered and arose no sound save when the hard keels creaked upon the ground the chieftain first leapt nimbly on the sand then followed fast his fierce and warlike band the shore was still no foe their landing barred no hector stood his island home to guard 
no clansman rushed impetuous to the attack to drive with might the wild invaders back where where is hector's deathful arm and blade where where the men he oft to victory led alas has valiant hector's prowess waned his foes unchallenged have a footing gained hark hark now pealed an agonizing yell as in the sea MacDougall's henchman fell, pierced by an arrow that still quivering swayed within the wound its brazen point had made. Again, 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 with deadly aim, the messengers of death loud whizzing came from daring men unseen amid the haze who crouched with Hector on the furzy braes. The feathered shafts from full-drawn bows were sprung, and mid the startled foes their challenge flung brave warriors fell and writhed upon the sands and wildly drew the barb with dying hands yea vainly strove in agony to stay the pulsing stream of life which ebbed away and sodden sands the hot blood greedy drank staining the spot wherein it bubbling sank full well MacDougall knew without dismay that hector and his men around him lay oblivious to the thickening arrowy storm his looks betrayed no fear nor dire alarm his ringing voice its chief-like orders gave which cheered the heart of each desponding brave down down men down until the fading haze flies from mclean's safe ambush on the braes obedient all they sank upon the shore and o'er their heads their shields aloft they bore against whose sloping fronts the arrows rung and curving far into the ocean sprung then hector knew as clear that voice was born his foeman was MacDougall, chief of lorn undaunted undismayed yea rather glad to measure swords with one who oft-times had in other years with devastation dire ravaged the lands and clansmen of his sire outnumbered now no rash onslaught he tried his skilful tactics numbers well supplied the dread confusion of attack on flanks he early learned and on the grassy banks he placed his little but determined force in two divisions mid the sheltering gorse where leading steeply downward to the bay the rugged bouldered path between them lay which thus commanding with advantage great their foeman's charge they anxiously did wait nor waited long for as the sun arose the haze vanished and they saw their foes now as the dark tide wave on etive shores rears its high crest and forward rolling roars or as a pin-up spate with mighty force rushes upon its broad resistless course so rose MacDougall's men and forward dashed and brightly in the sun their weapons flashed swift-footed o'er the sands with yelling wrath they sought the only upward tending path o'er rocks and stones disorderly they flew and to the ridge in breathless hurry drew MacDougall led them on and upward pressed to reach the gap upon the grassy crest unswerving unfatigued he scaled the height and gazed around but saw no foe to fight when suddenly from out each shady bush the valiant hector and his men did rush and loud arose their startling battle yell as on the clamoring foe they fiercely fell who staggering beheld the maddening grief maclean's between them and their warrior chief swords rung on swords fire flashed from every blow blood rushed in streams unto the sands below forward and forward still MacDougall's rushed the foremost fell to be by kinsmen crushed upon the quivering corpses of the slain they fighting came and strove the ridge to gain but as a compact phalanx stood their foes who mercilessly showered their deadly blows which crashing clave each high raised shining shield and smote the man beneath who downward reeled still on they came in wild despairing might unyielding stood the braves who held the height not all MacDougall's warlike numbers now could backward drive the thirty from that brow who spoke not quailed not but resolved to give their dearest blood for liberty to live part seven MacDougall's chieftain breast with anger burned and swiftly on the foe he fiercely turned but ere he could his sudden stroke bestow a readier sword met the descending blow twas nimble hector's on whose features played a smile of triumph as he quickly weighed the issues of a fight with lorne's dread lord who now had raised his yet untarnished sword 
and backward drew a pace, then scowling glared upon the half-clad youth who thus had dared to thwart his onset, and to turn aside the blade which had the royal Bruce defied. With sudden bound he on the stripling dashed, whose quicker weapon like a sunbeam flashed, and kissed with joy MacDougall's baffled steel, which now for once an equal match did feel. His groaning clansman roused his ireful heart. Again on Hector did he fiercely dart to be repelled with skilful blow or guard, and backward hurled upon the dewy sward. Ill could he brook defiance thus disclosed, and with the youth in deadly conflict closed. Now rung their blows upon each guardian shield, and rugged dents their angry might revealed. With equal skill the contest wildly raged, each knew a worthy foe he had engaged, though round them played the steely gleams of death. They thrust and struck with unabated breath, each lightning eye was fixed, each sparkling gleamed, each marked the point where an advantage seemed. And as each willing blade the opening sought, the sudden guard made sudden efforts naught. And victory, wavering tween such sons of fame, withheld the laurels that each well could claim till youthful Hector's unabated strength proclaimed him victor in the fight at length. For fast MacDougall's furious ire decayed, and feeble blows his waning powers betrayed. Pale grew his face, his watchful eyes grew dim, less swift to guard he shook in every limb. Fast heaved his breast with ever-lessening breath, and as he struck he reeled upon the heath. Defeat's dark demon raged within him now. Its withering shade sat scowling on his brow, and fanned the feeble flame of hope in vain, which mocked the hero as his strength did wane. But Hector tireless still the conflict sought, and by a subtle cut MacDougall smote upon the sword-arm, which all powerless hung. Then fell the blade which he in valor swung. Triumphant o'er his foe young Hector stood, nor sought he now to shed defenseless blood. Yield thee, MacDougall! yield he hoarsely cried and who art thou bold youth the chief replied hector maclean of an illustrious line yield thee macdougall now thy life is mine behold thy clansmen under thee succumb to foil aggression see our kinsmen come back to their galleys now thy men will be driven with the vengeance born of victory now rushed maclean's along the grassy fields and loudly struck their swords upon their shields with wild impetuosity they sought the ridge whereon their dauntless kinsmen fought, nor checked their speed but through the thin rank dashed, and on the foe with headlong fury crashed, who baffled, fled across the sands and sought safety on board their galley still afloat. Out from the bay with terror speed they drew, while in their midst thick showers of arrows flew. Eastward they sped with favoring tide and wind, and left their wounded and their chief behind who midst a throng of savage islemen stood unmoved, although they clamoured for his blood. Now Hector spoke, and hushed was every voice. Clansmen, MacDougall's fate must be my choice. No deed of wanton blood shall stain our name. Unsullied victory is our highest fame, who e'er the foe, what e'er the battle cause. We triumph best when ruled by honour's laws. MacDougall's chief, thy life I now bestow. Back to Dunley vanquished thou must go. Be thou the bearer of thy wounded men, and war no more unjustly gainst MacLean. The generous impulse stilled the angry band who loved the virtue in their chief's command. With tender grasp the dying and the dead within the galley of the chief were laid. The wounded next fraternal care received, such love from foes their hearts had ne'er conceived. Now ready all between the conquering clan MacDougall marched, a stern and gloomy man. And as he frowning slowly stepped on board, Hector, with princely grace, returned his sword. The proffered gift with haughty grasp he took, and thanked the donor with a threatening look. Then, as the blood-fraught galley seaward drew, he kissed the blade and waved its dark adieu. Undying hatred and revenge combined stood warders at the portals of his mind, and filled his heart with their demoniac fire, till the strange madness of their one desire reigned as the lord of his embittered life, and chained him slaved unto its fearful strife. The visions of his hate-disturbed brain were bloody, spectres muttering, MacLean. In horror's dreams he saw a ghastly train which, passing, whispered in his ear, MacLean. 
Lone on Dunley's ramparts every day, his restless eyes were fixed on Duart's Bay. No light of joy illumined his vengeful state. His life was now unfathomable hate. His lovely daughter's smiles had lost their charm, her soothing voice no more his heart could warm. Her constant fondnesses, her tears, her sighs, changed not the fierce gleam of his loveless eyes. MacDougall dreamt not that ere long her love would of his conqueror the conqueror prove. Decreed by heaven to meet her father's foe, they loved, was death, their death her father's woe. Part Eight. Bewitching mild-eyed nature bright awoke when her misty veil of night had left her vernal bosom bare, and vanished in the sun-souled air. The lark had risen from its nest, the deer had sought the mountain crest, the sea had lost its nightly hue, the flowers had parted from their dew. The streamlets poured their wanton lays, the lambkins frisked upon the braes, the hinds had yoked their oaken ploughs, the rosy maids had milked the cows. The clouds in smiling beauty high sailed o'er the blue deeps of the sky, when from her sudden slumber yoke MacDougall's dark-haired daughter woke and gazed around the chamber strange, while memory, with contracted rage from dreamy retrospection sought, the flickering truths of dawning thought, which ushered in with stern delight the horrors of the former night. The door was oped, and forward came a stately, gentle-featured dame, whose mother looks and smiles and voice were such as made the heart rejoice. The wondering maid she fond caressed and clasped her to her joyous breast. She kissed her cheek and kissed her brow, and welcomed her awakening now. Daughter of warriors, she said, I joy to find my care repaid. Dunley's maid, half rising, sighed, and strove the welling tears to hide. Her eyes beamed through her love's surfeit, her voice was tremulously sweet. Tell me, good mother, tell me true to whom my life and thanks are due. Where am I now? Whose home is this? Where dwells such Christian tenderness? Child of the waves, calm the unrest which lingers in thy anxious breast. Within our bosoms kindness reigns. Know we are friends, although Maclean's. My Hector was by heaven decreed to save thee in thy hour of need. Start not. No harm to thee shall come. Our clansmen shall convey thee home. Unto Dunley's warrior lord his daughter shall be safe restored. The tearful maiden warmly kissed the chieftain mother, whom she blessed, then from her couch she lightly rose at peace, though in the halls of those gainst whom her father erstwhile fought, on whom his wild revenge was sought. The morn's repast was quickly spread, and by the chieftain's lady led, the blushing maiden entered then the hall, where sat the chief, Maclean, who rose and gave with kindly smiles a lordly welcome to the isles. His hair, touched by time's silvern spell, adown his shoulders streaming fell. Of kindred hue his flowing beard in snowy furrowed waves appeared, and gave a charm unto his face which glowed with patriarchal grace. His eyes beamed with the sole repose which years of happiness disclose. His broad brow showed in sundry scars the valor emblems of his wars. His countenance was calm, benign, his smile was fatherly divine, of stalwart mien unbowed by years, his voice dispelled the maiden's fears, and as she heard his gentle tones she gazed with reverence upon the hoary chief, the island lord who welcomed her unto his board. Ere seated round the table all, young Hector strode into the hall. One hurried bow he gave the maid, whose simultaneous glance betrayed the strange confusion, unexpressed which bodes a maiden's feelings best as on her saviour she gazed love's tumult in her bosom blazed her meed of thanks refused to come her eyes spoke now her lips were dumb she heard of hector as of one bloodthirsty cruel scarce a man who drove her father from the shore in battle nigh two months before her father's ire she deemed unjust she saw in hector one to trust as Hector gazed upon the maid, his heart from every theme was swayed. His morning meal before him lay untouched, save in a listless way. A feast of fire o'erfilled him now, he knew not why, he felt not how. With truthful eye the chief divined the thoughts which racked the maiden's mind. And ere the simple meal was o'er, he sent his henchman to the shore to launch his boat, 
to bend the sail, to spread his banner to the gale. Sweet maid of lorn, thou must away, though welcome here thou must not stay. Thy father's grief none can reveal, thou canst alone his anguish heal. Hector shall steer thee o'er the sea, and thy deliverer shall be. Farewell, sweet maid, our prayers are thine, may future joys around thee shine. Part 9 Right well MacLean had read her heart, the maid was anxious to depart. Her earnest gratitude of soul o'erpowering rushed beyond control, she sobbing bade them all adieu, and from the castle slowly drew, young Hector lightsome led the way, where in the cove the galley lay. Then, as a gallant courtier lord, he placed the weeping maid on board, with skilful hands he plied the oars, and shot beyond the sheltering shores. Then hoisted up the broad brown sail, which filled unto the gentle gale, with favoring tide and favoring wind, Grey Duart soon was left behind. Right merrily the boat sped on, and now they felt they were alone. They spoke, neath Hector's voice the maid the hidden mystery obeyed. Her world erst fair seemed fairer now. Her eyes beheld life's heaven below, and yielding to the conqueror's sway, they pledged eternal love that day. There is a music in the sea, an everlasting melody, an earnest chant of throbbing love, an echo of God's voice above, which gives unto our hearts the peace that bids our mutual loves increase. The little dancing waves rejoice to hear a maiden's love-fraught voice. They leap with frenzied mirth and glee as fall her vows of constancy, and fain their foamy crests would bless affection's sacred, primal kiss. They sang with joy when Hector brave his heart unto the maiden gave. They leapt with smiles on every crest to hear the maiden's vow expressed. With hand in hand, eye fixed on eye, the lovers kissed, and seemed to die neath the enraptured bliss divine, which springs when love's great fountains join. They neared Carrera's rocky shore and round its northern headland bore, swift for Dunnelly's curving bay, the galley bounded on its way. They saw upon the glistening sand one solitary warrior stand, who marked MacLean's dread banner fly upon the nodding mast on high. A whistle loud and shrill he blew, then from the cliffs MacDougall's flew, but ere they bent a single bow he spied his daughter on the prow. His hatred wilder, fiercer rose to mark her mid his deadly foes. Ere slid the galley on the sand, Hector beheld the threatening band. Then lowered his sail, and seized the oar, and slowly neared the dreaded shore. One word of love he gave the maid, whose gestures all their vengeance stayed. One look of hope beamed in her eye, which seemed to say, I all defy. Impatient now his child to free, the chieftain rushed into the sea. Before the keel had touched the sand, he grasped again his daughter's hand. Then in his frenzied, powerful arm he bore ashore her lovely form. Hector he saw and darkly flung a scowl of hate from vengeance wrung. Bold, standing with an oar in hand before MacDougall's gathering band, he forced the unwilling boat astern, and sadly could the maid discern amid the throng of clansmen wild with joy at finding thus their child. Remembering their hateful foe, they ceased their cries, and from each bow discharged a shower of darts which fell harmless into the ocean swell. Far o'er the sea on southern tack, Hector, with wistful eye, looked back. A ceaseless longing o'er him stole, a darkness settled on his soul. The brightness of the morn had fled, and left him gloomy fears instead. The dawn rise of love's cheering ray had vanished all too soon away. The golden charm of hope's bright goal seemed fading from his saddened soul, and as he neared his native shore one burning wish alone it bore. MacLean received with joy his son as if a victory he had won. But Hector's heart was far away, his Duart's charm seemed to decay. Unrest's remorseless, cruel band had made him now an altered man. He sought the shores in darkest night, and ne'er returned till morning's light. They watched, but none the paths could name, or how he went, or whence he came. Ah! In his skiff he stole away across the sound to Oban's bay where by King Fingal's rugged stone MacDougall's maid be met alone, renewed their vows, repledged their faith, and kissed unswerving love till death. Part 10 
not all a daughter's love assuaged the hate which in MacDougall's bosom burned elate not all her soft expostulation sweet could the dread demon of revenge defeat unmoved and coldly calm he heard her prayer for well he knew that hector was her care his trusty warder oft in midnight hour saw two mysterious forms beneath the tower and oft of late had heard the sound of oars receding in darkness from the shores to crush her love to overcome his foe his clansmen nightly watched the beach below and when they heard her hector's parting song they swiftly stole by secret paths along and rushed upon the youth whose ready blade gleamed but an instant and their onslaught stayed with sudden swoop and straight delivered thrust three warriors fell before him in the dust his light steel shield with cunning motion flashed and on its front their blows descending crashed forward and forward still they pressed combined struck but one blow and wounded reeled behind on every hand his sword appeared to see their covert cuts of dark ferocity and instantly his ready guard essayed to foil each stroke that fell and notched his blade around him lay in groaning helpless rows the prostrate forms of his remorseless foes some glared revenge some cursed with dying breath some strove to strike him in the throes of death some drew their dirks in anguish of despair upraised their arms and dying struck the air some tore in agony while life remained the clotted grass their own life-blood had stained unwounded all the youth unconquered stood starred with the red drops of his foeman's blood fired with the madness springing from defeat they blindly rushed and struck but to retreat then forward stood amid the stiffening slang MacDougall's chief who fiercely hissed maclean awed by their chief the clansmen ceased to fight and viewed the combat with intense delight revenge imbued his unaffected powers his blows descended on the youth in showers who stood unwavering and the onset foiled yea smote the chief who wounded back recoiled implacable and heedless of his wound he rushed on hector with a sudden bound whose sword hand swollen with conflict filled the hilt and now for once his weakening nature felt while raged the strife loud from the cliffs above a cry arose of agony and love the watching clansmen gazed in wild dismay down from each crag upon her headlong way MacDougall's daughter rushed with frantic cries as hector wounded fell no more to rise swift through the silent horde she madly fled oblivious to the dying and the dead and stooped o'er hector who with fitful breath smiled still his love and whispered low in death upon his dripping blade MacDougall leant as o'er the youth his weeping daughter bent who kissed his blood-stained lips and wildly cried cursed is the blade that pierced my hector's side then strangely gazed around below above and falling died upon her only love MacDougall gazed nor thought his daughter dead till stooping gently raised her lovely head her cold pale face too truly told the tale then burst a father's deep heart-rending wail her eyes were closed and silent now her tongue bright on her pallid cheeks her last tears clung the gentle hands which oft had stroked his brow clenched in their death grasp hector's bosom now the lips which oft had sung in joyous mood bore the red imprint of his trickling blood with groans of terror anguish pain and grief the clansmen gathered round their stricken chief who gazed in silence on his daughter's course while o'er her fell his tears of deep remorse warriors he cried behold my daughter dead no more around us will her light be shed heaven wars with me oh that i had but felt the depth of love which in her bosom dwelt here let the lovers lie no more to part in dust united slumbering heart to heart neath fingal's stone let them be gently laid to rest forever in its storied shade in coming years the warriors of our race will stand uncovered o'er their resting place and breathe the tale of how MacDougall's maid loved unto death and dying love obeyed the mighty stone untouched by time shall tell in voiceless whisperings here hector fell with folded arms 
in stern and lowering mood MacDougall's chieftain meditative stood while trembling weeping clansmen dug the grave for all he loved and for her hector brave no song of woe burst from the anguished crowd when both were laid within their earthly shroud the reddened sods they laid with care above and all was hid from eyes of grief and love the chief in dreamy silence strode away unto unutterable woe a prey revenge and hate had from his bosom fled he longed for love but all of love was dead no joy or peace within his halls remained to hell's unrest he felt forever chained while conscience with red burning beak and claws consumed the heart which broke its maker's laws e'en coming foes led on by scotland's king stirred not his soul nor could war's pleasure bring his sword was sheathed his path was toward the tomb and brander's battle pealed donnelly's doom end of poem this recording is in the public domain Glenora by Thomas Campbell Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould O oh, heard ye young pibroch sound sad in the gale Where a band cometh slowly with weeping and wail? Tis the chief of Glenora laments for his dear and her sire, And the people are called to her beer. Glenora came first with the mourners and shroud, Her kinsmen they followed, but mourn not aloud. Their plaids all their bosoms were folded around, They marched all in silence, they looked on the round. In silence they reached over mountain and moor To a heath where the oak tree grew lonely and hoar. Now here let us place the gray stone of her cairn. Why speak ye no word, said Glenara the stern? And tell me, I charge you, ye clan of my spouse, Why fold ye your mantles, why cloud ye your brows? So spake the rude chieftain, no answer is made, But each mantle unfolding a dagger displayed. I dreamt of my lady, I dreamt of her shroud, Cried a voice from the kinsman all wrathful and loud, And empty that shroud and that coffin did seem. Glenara, Glenara, now read me my dream. O oh, pale grew the cheek of that chieftain, I ween, When the shroud was unclosed and no lady was seen. When a voice from the kinsman spoke louder in scorn, Twas the youth who had loved the fair Ellen of Lorn. I dreamt of my lady, I dreamt of her grief, I dreamt that her lord was a barbarous chief. On a rock of the ocean fair Ellen did seem, Glenara, Glenara, now read me my dream. In dust, lo, the traitor has knelt to the ground, And the desert revealed where his lady was found. From a rock of the ocean that beauty is born. Now joy to the house of fair Ellen of Lorne. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of the Rock by Emily Pfeiffer. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Part 1. Rose red for the banner of love, and a blush for the cheek of the bride. To the valleys and hills of fair Loch Fine the word went far and wide. They will marry this day, and marry to death our flower of ladies, Elizabeth. On through the valleys and down from the hills, as the gathering cry of the clan had called them forth, through the moithering mist the lieges rode, or ran, to meet at the foot of the runic cross and wring out the heart of their wrong and loss. And there met them here and there on the breeze, faint as a word of shame, the sound of a bell, but they knew not well as dubiously it came, or whether it chimed or whether it tolled, but they thought a knell had been more bold. And they questioned the wind as it rose and fell above and about Loch Fine, the wind that lashed at the shrinking wave and harried the grove of pine. Is your cry as the cry of her love on the rack? or only Our Lady's coronac. But when they had come to the cross, and thence peered over the castle wall, and beheld the rout that was thronging the court, and the train that swarmed out of the hall, with the banners that flaunted beside the door, and the dog and the ship that the banners bore, and saw by the fiery beard and eyes, and the motions cold and dull, 
that the man who was leading the bartered bride was MacLean of Duart and Mall. Then they knew they had married to worse than death their flower of ladies, Elizabeth. Rose red is the banner of love. But this bride is pale, snow pale. And she grows snow cold as he helps her to horse, as the touch of the groom were bale. But she proudly follows the lead of fate, nor once looks back when she passes the gate. Some tuneless souls will meet and make no answering music here, but keep in our low reverberate air the peace of the outer sphere, and passing mix with the silent dead and leave the word of our life unsaid. But not Glenaris falls at spate with our lusty voice for praise, and not the vocal heart of spring that beats in its covert ways, not stream or merle or plaining dove went ever so near to utter love as twain who under the marriage tree once heard their voices all, and sent a confluent answer back to the cuckoo's double call, sudden note so piercing sweet it drowned the waterfall, till with the primrose she grew pale, he wakeful with the nightingale, for all as wise as their hearts had been to know and to claim their own, they saw how oft by the felon world love's dues are overthrown. The world that knows not thine or mine but snatches a treasure from off a shrine. And so it fell from the deep argyle had a bargain he would make, and his sister must be the seal of it should it burn her heart or break. Thus he married her to the slow, the dull, red-bearded tyrant, the chief of Maul. The clansmen saw her where she came in the hold of the red Maclean, who once had ridden more free than free with love at her bridal rein, and passing left them for lingering trace the smile that had flowered on every face. They let her go with never a word, was never a word to say. Macallum Moore was lord of all, and his will must have its way. Though the heart of the speechless bride was wrath as the torrent roaring beside her path, but when to Cladgy's ferry they came, and the chief had called a halt, while his shaggy train on bite and sup were making swift assault, she lighted down and knelt beside an image of the crucified. There, overborne with the stroke of fate, as droopingly she sunk, she had not known how near her heart there knelt a cowled monk, till he took her hand and whispered low, and she felt it riven with joy and woe. Here was the voice in all the world, for her the only voice, the hand whose touch in face of death had made her sense rejoice, and for these hearts with love so rife one moment but of common life. Up, love, and fly, for one heartbeat love had and held his own. They mingled breath, they mingled tears, a word and he had flown, had carried her over ford and dyke from Campbell's and Maclean's alike, she strove with him, she clasped the cross. Let pine, she said, or die, but never from this forefront of fate tempt me to fail or fly. It has not been laid upon any man, but on me to suffer, and save the clan. Macallum Moore has spared to meet Maclean as in open fight, so awake or asleep in his island keep I must face him day or night. For a true Argyle is but one thing sure, the will and the word of Macallum Moore. They look to the right, they look to the left, O oh, fair and cruel world, where tender firstlings of the spring on gusts of march are hurled. The wild wind bent the pine tops tall, it rent the folded leaves and small, the mocking sun laughed down on all. They look to left, they look to right, and lo, through the cloven mist, Lock awe that laughed to the laughing sun as stormily they kissed. Cold sun, she said, in bitter bliss, dear love, be witness. Never kiss of man shall mar the print of this. A heavy freight bore down that day the Cladgy's ferry boat, and one that saw it had liefer seen it founder, I think, than float. Better a bride so foully wed were bedded here in the lake, he said. But the lake would none of them bride or groom or scurvy train and tossed, twixt Cladgy's ferry and Brander Pass, the boat that crossed and crossed, and the eyes that hung on the throat of the pass saw blocking the way of love the mass of dark Ben Crocken, 
or ere they turned in wrath from the path of men and the wayworn bride by forest and flood through moss and reedy fen went forced on her way in the teeth of the wind by the men of mull who were trooping behind they crossed the sound the dim isle seems adrift in the wind and rain as cold in the shadow of castle duart its sodden shore they gain but the iron click of the stanchion gate rings home like the closing jaws of fate her bower maidens had busked the bride the feast was long and loud but she scarce had sat at the board more still had she sat there in her shroud and her courage failing for weary head tis a far cry to lock all she said part two the wassail had reached its stormy height the feast was over in hall when there came and stood at the lady's side a gloomy sensical as he pointed the way to a turret dear she knew it led to the bride chambere and she that was rose of fair argyle a white rose she was then stood up and waited no second sign but bowed to the roistering men and passed with her bower maids out of the hall in the lead of the wordless sensical then some who noted her proud and pale bent laughing over the board she's as wide as a widow's callant they said who should wed a maiden sword and in sooth the lady elizabeth had blithelier followed the feet of death than the form which fronting the torch's glare cast a giant shade on the turret stair and when she stood in her bridal bower she turned to her maidens twain no hand but this of mine may dress the bride of the red maclean so lend me but your prayers this night and fare ye well till the fair daylight she cast her garments one by one alone as she stood there she was to sight no summer flower but a woman deadly fair when forth she drew the golden comb and loosed the golden hair which sheathed her body to her knee a ringed and burnished panoply then as a swimmer with her arms the amber flood she spurned to either side and in her hand she took a gem that burned that rose and fell upon her heart as a thing that bore in its life apart twas a golden dragon in jewelled mail that lay betwixt breast and breast over that gentle lady's heart couched as a lance in rest and that cunning sample of goldsmith's work it was the handle of a dirk she drew it forth of its leathern sheath and she felt its steely edge then gave some drops of her quick young blood to its point as if in pledge ere she wound her hair in a silken thong and the dirk in that golden chain and strong she laid the dragon again to sleep in its balmy place of rest o oh god that a home so soft and fair should harbor such a guest then her winsome self she rearrayed and fell on her trembling knees and prayed she muttered many an ave then and told off many a bead till her passion sealed her lips for words but mocked so sore a need then she stopped and listened beside the breeze and only waited upon her knees and as she listened the distant sound of wassail ceased and all her soul rushed armed into her ears at the sound of a dull footfall which wound its way to the topmost tower where was the lady's bridal bower the wind was piping through lock and loop but of nothing was she ware there was no sound in all the world but that foot upon the stair as she listened and heard it rise her soul rushed armed into her eyes she stood up wide in her snowy pall a breathing image of death the torchlight crowning her radiant hair her sombre face beneath as i am a virgin pure this night so keep me god through dark to light as i am a child of the deep argyle souls of my fathers teach me while the iron door on its hinges turned and closed on the married twain and redder yet from his deep carouse there stood the red maclean and their four eyes met and no word was said till his glance fell off on the vacant bed then she i have prayed of mary's grace that she would us assoil for that this day with lips forsworn we sought to cut the coil of mortal hate that has ever lain betwixt the argyle and maclean then lo he laughed to kneel and pray lady beseemeth thee but to make of our false oath a true is the task that fitteth me 
My word before the morrow's sun ye shall avouch the work well done. He moved a step to where she stood, and she recoiled a pace. His wandering eyes again were set in wonder on her face. They paused. They made a mutual stand. His breath fell hot upon her hand. You are a lord of the isles, quoth she, and the islemen's mood is light. But I am a child of the firm mainland, and I change not in a night. There is naught of me that a man may win, and I think not to overlay sin with sin. Now nothing could hap that would make us twain but false as woman and man. Yet by the grace of God we may still be true, each to our name and clan, and each to each in a sidelong way true to the bond we have sealed this day. You ask for a gauge of my feudal chief, but of me nor word nor smile. You sought but to better the strength you had with the strength of the deep argyle. You shall have your due, but no more of me than a contract seal and warranty. He laughed in his beard. Ay, many have tried, but all have tried in vain to meet with a measure that was not his, the due of the red MacLean. Still with iron hand he has held his right, but never so close as he willed this night. She set herself as a hind at bay. She straightened her back to the wall. I, that am come as a hostage here, would you use me as a thrall? Not so, quoth he, but by limb and life I'll use you as my wedded wife. I am an earl's daughter, she said, and my oath is worth a knight's, and I swear by the health of my mother's soul that the kiss which first alights on me as we two lie in bed shall have the force to strike me dead. You are an earl's daughter, he said, and a maid without a stain. But as you are here in Castle Duart, and I the Red MacLean, that oath shall no more be your screen than if you were the veriest queen. She shrunk as into the granite wall she parried his rude embrace. His fierce eyes glowed like the autumn fern, his breath was hot on her face. Her heart seemed knocking against the stone, it beat as it would burst her zone. She cried a cry but it fell stillborn, it died in her throat for fear, though the meaning ablaze in the dauntless gaze of her flame-blue eyes was clear. And it was that the Lady Elizabeth was ready to give as to take of death. Her hand bore hard on her heaving breast, and he knew whereto it clung, and he saw how her eyes on the turn of his two deadly warders hung. Then his caitiff soul succumbed to hers, he let her go and sprung back, with the cry of a ravening beast balked on the eve of a gory feast. Twice already that tyrant chief had seen the accusing steel, cleaving the way to his savage heart in a victim's last appeal. And he hated more the better he knew the flash of that lightning cold and blue. He glanced at the dagger's golden string, and his sodden wit grew clear. Where to? Where to? I will stalk this maid as we stalk the highland deer. The fumes of wassail that left his brain had left it free to fear. She is yet too wild, he said, and deep, to be taken waking or asleep. He spoke her fair, you have journeyed far by mountain and by flood, and to you of all that life hath dear sleep only seemeth good. So you shall taste untroubled rest this night, as twere a stranger guest. Her left hand sheathed the shining dirk, she gave to him her right. Now lay your sword betwixt us two, as you are a belted knight. Then God be watch and ward, she said, and stretched herself by the sword in bed. And hourly, as the night wore on, she lay in the deepening gloom. Her two hands folded upon her breast like a statue on a tomb. But she seemed to feel the dirk beneath her fingers, tingling in its sheath, and the moon came softly out of a cloud in the midmost of the night, and through the loophole gazed at her, she lying still and white, beside the castle's lord who slept while she her weary vigil kept. But when the morning's face rose pale o'er the shoulder of Kurok and Ben, she stole from out the bride Chambert, a joyful woman then, and alone in face of the risen sun she dared to weep. The day was won. Part three. When the morning board with the rests of the feast was set, 
and the martial kin, the vassals in chief of the castle's lord, still heavy with sleep, dropped in. They found a smiling chatelaine threading her keys on a silver chain, and still when her lord, like a thundercloud full charged, came lowering down with her own white hands, she served to him the prime of the venison. So tending him in the downward eyes, it hooved him not to speak or rise. Thus every morning she was meek as a loving wife might be, and full of service and soothfastness as a lady of high degree, in a house and hall a gooden's power, a gracious presence in lady's bower. At eventide she graced the feast with a face of merry cheer, and her voice to the harp when the harp went round, as the laverock's note was clear. So she singeth in the night, they say, as a bird that singeth in the day. And seeing her so amenable and lovely in daylight hour, her lord would follow as time might serve for dalliance in lady's bower, where sitting apart on the window-stone they parlayed together as if alone. And once, she making the shuttle fly her maiden spinning near, he seized her fluttering hands and laughed, They are captives, white with fear. Nay, call them rather, she laughed back, pale victims, faithful on the rack. And seeing her frail as she was fair, he measured with thievish eye the length of the dirk which clove her breast, and thought where the hilt might lie. But he saw no way through her silken suit, which clipped her close as the rind the fruit. And seeing her fair as she was frail in the sting of a newborn need, his tuneless voice for once rang true, his fierce tongue learnt to plead. Then her daylight face was in eclipse, the shadow of night on her eyes and lips. As she answered him, While the stars endure you will get no more of me than what you hold at my brother's hand, for a gift is of the free. That hour which made us two hand fast, the time to win as to woo was past. You are haggard, dame, as a hawk, he said, and he gave her hands reprieve but we tamed the wildest tercelet that ever we let live. Then he rose and left the bower in wrath, and the stones cried out upon his path. Craft is the strength of Argyle. She knows our heads are under one hood, but that hood shall be cover for mine alone, if ever me seemeth good. The sleuth-hound in vain, if he failed of that, had been held in leash with the mountain-cat. Now is better than then, good brother Argyle, New love is like new wine. I will put to the proof this brotherly shield before it is worn too fine. And see, when my hand has done a thing, how you make it good in the eye of the king. He called aloud to his name's men all, as they loitered about the court. Come, rouse ye men for a bloody raid, and I warrant ye good sport. The better that we by night shall stoop and seize our prey in a silent swoop. And some of your band must go by land, and some shall come by sea. And those shall ride with Malcolm Moore, and these shall sail with me. Our meeting place, Glengarry Bay, the boats, there needs no more to say. Then some to horse, and some to ship, some sailed, some rode or ran, while shrill at their head the pipers played the gathering of the clan. The work was death, the road was rough. They knew no more it was enough. But when they came to Loch Nakeel, nor pipe nor voice was heard. You might have caught, as you brushed the ling, the cry of a brooding bird. And a league or ever you reached the shore, have steered by the dull Atlantic roar. Then warily they at Glengarry Bay made sign to the waiting boat, and the word goes round whereto they are bound, as they silently get afloat and they steal upon Cairnburg's island keep, where it lies in the cradling surf asleep. Then little they heard of the scared seabird or the near Atlantic roar, for the fierce war clang of the crossing swords as led by Malcolm Moore. They stormed the keep, and its keepers slew or laid in irons before. MacLean with his merry men sailed in, safe to conquer and bold to win. He passed the body of Cairnburg's lord with its gaping wounds and red and he spurned it from him with his foot. He did not fear the dead. Then he filled a horn and gave a toast. We'll drink, quoth he, to our silent host. 
The thirsty crew swarmed up, they left the dead men in the bound, and drunk with blood in wassail deep their reeling senses drowned. The captives' groans, the victors' glee, the lashing of the ruthless sea, made up the wild world's harmony. O loving God, whom all men loved when hating most their kind, they lifted bloody hands in prayer, now all are stricken blind, and we never more may see the sun till all men's eyes and hearts are one. Then Red MacLean set his signet seal on the castle's garnered store, then he filled his pouch with its gold and gave the keys to Malcolm Moore, whom he left in charge, bold man and true, while himself took ship with his jolly crew. And he thought to this frost-bound maid of mine, when I come red-handed in, will the ice of her virgin pride break up, shall I come as I came, to win? But the spirits that wrought for him by day were not at night, and she held her way. Then he fell in longing by day and night, as the sick man longs for health, and he longed for her by night and day, as the beggar longs for wealth. As one who hung over the pit of hell might clutch at a star-beam ere he fell, and his stricken thought turned round on himself in his dim low-lying soul, caught a shadowy glimpse of a fairer way, as he deemed to a fairer goal. So a heavier stone on his heart was flung, which helped but to sink him where he hung. He dreamed of tortures of rare device as to give his passion ease, and once in his dire extremity he sued her upon his knees. But alone, without her Campbell shield, who knows to die, needs not to yield. For bulwark, and for last defense, she had the strength of steel. The sword betwixt them was a sign, the dagger was a seal. And each fine hair that wound about the dagger's hilt, a watchful scout. But sitting alone on the window stone, though still was the summer air, she heard a whispering on the sea, a moaning she knew not where. Then she looked to the hills where the two winds meet, and saw them wrestle together, and beat each against each, and pant and smoke, like beasts that fret an unequal yoke. And she said, O love, that I knew so fair, whoever had thought of thee, that thy summary breath could raise the storm and the wreck, who shall it be? Were the end but death, would it now were here, and a white-fringed pall on my maiden beer. Part four. As the red MacLean went to and fro, twixt Stewart and Cairnburg Tower, one day he chanced to spy a rose, it seemed a single flower, with an open eye but in some closed part the bud was shaping a double heart. And this flower grew up so fresh and fair on land that was held in fief, the Trejnish Isles, which her father owned, of MacLean, a vassal chief. And this fair maid, having a vassal soul, of her beauty paid the tyrant toll. And his galled spirit found ease in her from the bond of the proud Argyle. And his famished pride rose up full-fed and rampant beneath her smile. That he laughed his laugh, I will take this flower and plant as a thorn in my lady's bower. So he took the maiden with him in croup, and to Castle Duart they came where my lady looked her through and through, without, or pity, or blame. Would God, she thought, this flower would twine and establish herself in this place of mine. So she let it be, and it wound and wound, it was so soft and young, so lithe as the green shoots felt their way, but they hardened where they clung, till they bent the stake the way they chose, for this plant it was a climbing rose. And the red MacLean, the chief of the clan, to her was the chief of men. And she thought in her pride, could I win to his side as the mists upon Cruachan bend? My matron coif would be borne so high it would shine the first in the great world's eye. Now MacLean in the strength of others is waxed so proud that naught avails. But the ships that traverse the sound of Mull must lower their topmost sails. When of Duart they come within gunshot, still the woman who called him Lord bent not. She looked from the seeming single flower that twined until, none knew how, the tender shoot that had clasped a twig had all but been a bough. To her baffled lord, for his changed desire, had held her safe in its counterfire. And he who noted her morning face grow clearer, and yet more clear, beheld her the only untamed thing of all that came him near. And his longing was as the thirst for blood, his hate was the hate of fear. And the fear and longing so grew and grew that together they rove his heart in two. 
and still he saw her the bond that bound clan campbell to his name and knew the issue between them one that for very pride and shame in his strong walls filled with his vassal kin his hand unholpen must lose or win the round world spinning about the sun appeareth a twofold arc it nothing knoweth of high or low but only of light and dark that many dreaming they climb a height are boring deep in the pitchy night so the wilding rose it crept and crept it was so soft and fair that it wound till it reached the chamber door at the top of the turret stair as its sweetness waited the air within she thought one night he will twirl the pin he will open and put my lady forth he will set me by his side and so it fell and my lady rose and passed in her virgin pride from out of the chamber adown the stair with a foot as light as a bird of the air then the fierce MacLean, when as chatelaine she greeted him from her place and he caught the tenser tone of her voice the light on her morning face was hounded as by the devils in hell to quench the spirit he could not quell and his limmer striking deeper root still darkly wound her way for she hated who only reigned at night the woman who ruled by day and at castle duart the fiends full fain went up and down betwixt these twain then the limmer made an image of wax alike in every part to my lady's self and when all was done she stuck it through the heart dwindle and dwine in shade and shine she said till all of thine be mine and ever beside the waxen shape in the gloaming of the day with folded hands she crooned the curse as a troubled soul might pray dwindle and dwine in shade and shine till all be mine that now is thine in an evil hour the baffled chief looked in as she crooned the spell he plucked the shroud from the waxen shape you have wrought this passing well my lady's face and the smile thereof here hate hath done the work of love my lady's face as she lives not so my lady's face he said not as she lives to flout us to but as she might lie dead then each glanced up as in vague surprise and shrunk at the light in the other's eyes for the wish that was quick in the woman's breast had mothered the thought of the man and he said i harry this work of wax and the woman you would ban shall feel the sting in her heart of stone but his laugh rang hollow and died a groan he seized the knife he struck it anew he turned in the wounded wax take heed of this bloodless beauty he said that thereof nothing lacks we will keep this saint as in a shrine she may be worth your life and mine he led his limmer forth and turned the key ere he went his gate if hate can do the work of love so love the work of hate then his fierce heart surged in its beaten pride as the great wave surged in the high springtide part five my lady sat in her bower and span from a newly plenished creel she loved the wild sea noise that drowned the droning of her wheel nor feared to hear the low winds race through the tall spear-grass to their meeting-place but the restless wind awoke her heart where her love was laid asleep and it rose up wild like a startled child it waked like a child to weep o world forlorn in the wan gray weather and young heart weeping and wailing together for the wrestling wind recalled a time when the gray wan world was green when the sun was high her lost love nigh and the sting of love so keen in the stroke that cleft her heart in twain she knew not if it were joy or pain the wind the waves the droning wheel no new sound thrilled the air but her flesh made motion that some strange thing some loathly to life stood there she stopped her wheel the fine thread broke it was her lord he laughed he spoke wouldst give your thought in my thought stead you'd win by the exchange he said she turned from him she locked her hands and laid them athwart her breast she feared belike his questing gaze from sanctuary might rest a name she knew the faintest breath betraying would betray to death put by your wheel and spin no more come lady and come with me 
You ever have loved the singing wind, you love the dancing sea. My Beorlin is on the shore, leave flax and fancies, spin no more. His voice was soft, his words were smooth, his eye had a feline glow. You seemed to see it burn more bright that the light was waxing low. He smiled, repeating as before, leave flax and fancies, spin no more. She left her wheel, she left her bower, she followed the false MacLean. The piper piped them to the shore, he piped a doleful strain. The pibroch of Macrimmon Moor, the way you go you'll come no more. The chieftain's foster brethren twain hung on the shallop side, that shook in the breeze as a courser shakes, ere he steadies himself in his stride. The lady barely brooked their help in her strength of youth and pride. They backed the boat through the blown sea scurf and bored her all in the boiling surf. The helm was tain of the red MacLean, the oars of Donald Dhu, and Shamish, he of the bloody hands, and they were a grisly crew. But my lady's spirit rose bold and free twixt the singing wind and the dancing sea. O oh, youth, what art thou for gallant stuff, well known to the fiend despair? Of him you haply will take of death, but never will doff to care. A gleam of sun, a breath of brine, will mount your pulses as brisk new wine. The good boat breasted the creaming wave, she rose in the teeth of the breeze. She charged again as a fiery steed was stricken aback by the seas. The mountains seemed to soar and dive, the dim world heaved as yet alive. The Norse-built keep of Castle Duart, that one while gaunt and bare, looked glowering from its stony height, melted as smoke and air. As faint from chat dissolving shore, the pibroch wailed, you'll come no more. But where the two winds meet, the drift had loosed a lurid cloud which floated up as the tide went down in fashion as a shroud or like her to a woman drowned with arms outspread and hair unbound as the rowers caught in the lady's eyes a shadow of vague affright they turned about on their laboring oars to question the waning light and deep in the downdraft of one thought a moment those four souls were caught then looked at her with wolfish eyes, and fierce the red MacLean. Then looked at her with conscious eyes, and keen those gillies twain. Their meeting glances quelled her breath, they seemed to smite, and deal her death. The pibroch's note was heard no more, the pallid mist had spread, o'er all the world a winding sheet, for all the world seemed dead. The wind and the wave upon its track shrieking the lost world's coronac. But broadening over their bows they see a line of angry foam that hard on a bare, nigh sunken rock with maddening haste beats home. And all the woe that was no more, the dead world's woe was in its roar. The lady heard, and she rose up pale in the quivering boat upright. It was but the blind young blood that rose. Alas, what hope in flight? What hope of any help might be betwixt the dead world and the sea? And looking ahead where the breaker struck, the black, low-lying shore, t'was a man's hoarse voice that smote her ear, smote through the deafening roar. There one in love with death, it said, might have white sheets for a marriage bed. Then not for tumult of wind or wave that lady's heart beat high. It swung with the dead dull weight of lead, it struck as for danger nigh. A wild alarum whereat each sense doubled the force of its frail defense. And served by the drift of the landward seas, the boat makes straight for the rock. She shoots the waves and in the trough lies stunned as if with the shock then writes herself as fearing more the helmsman than the deadly shore. Dumb mid the thunder of wind and surge the savage helmsman steers, the world in lapsing from out their sight is clamoring at their ears, but through the tumult they can feel the shingles grind a quivering keel, and swept ashore on a towardly wave they haul the good boat in, and without a word the brethren fall to work in the wildering din. 
some deadlier task and still to come would seem to hold these brethren dumb then swill as strokes of the stormy sea more rude than the raging wind the lady is ware of two sudden arms that seize her body and bind and knows from its beating that dull way the heart her dagger had kept at bay the red maclean none other than he he has her in hand at last and o oh, ye smouldering fires of hell this time he holds her fast the teeth of the dragon beneath her vest are buried deep in her bleeding breast he stood with his bride on that trampled shore they two and they alone and with brackish kisses he pressed and pressed as one who would make his own her shuddering lips then he cast her down as a man might cast a stone and the rock that was all that was left of the world seemed sinking with that light weight so hurled he turned where the tattered fringe of the sea lighted the falling night that face that face on the brown sea ware had shone so ghastly white he dares the foaming wrath of the surge he boards his boat as in flight he shouts haste brothers make for the large the waves are roaring a counter charge the foster brothers they heave their hearts loud beating against the prow but in face of the countervailing sea the labor of man is slow and somewhat white hangs on to the boat for bearing the shallop to get afloat ah what but the swift young blood again uprisen as with a cry the voice of its still aspiring life not yet is it time to die has sent my lady in this wild way with grappling hands to plead and pray he struck her off, the caitiff MacLean, the very breakers had fled, to let her kneel, but there be lost men, and damned or ere they be dead. Kneel, woman, kneel, said the red MacLean, and kneel as once I knelt, in vain. The sea in its sovereign strength returned and took the maid to its breast, then arched itself, a triumphant wave, and bore her high on its crest, to lay the face so ghostly fair unharmed again on the brown sea ware my lady rose in the strength of her pride she saw herself there alone she rose and blessed the sundering sea the islet was all her own she rose and rose to its topmost ledge she made thereof a throne she cried maclean of duart farewell we're parted now as heaven and hell no blot on the shrouding mist maclean with his whole dark world seemed dead all even to the very hate of him gone like a knotless thread so that behind as about above was nothing left her but death and love then she wept for ruth of her maiden truth love have i waked for thee by day and night but to face thee now with this loathed stain on me come ocean and with your bitter brine sweeten these ravished lips of mine the hydra heads of the western waves broke parted to north and south they lipped the shore commixed and closed as one vast foaming mouth that hungered for her evermore that all but slew her with its roar and still she called upon love false love to think thy summary breath should drive a soul that trusted thee on this wild way of death the foam-fringed rock was wearing small scarce bigger now than a maiden's pall the clamoring surges foamed and fell pressed nearer and yet more near then plunged and quivered in pale recoil of pity or eck of fear they broke they wandered round her seat they went they came they licked her feet and still she cried and still she clung o oh, treacherous sea and slow come take my life and make an end since death will have it so the mad sea melted at her commands came back and kissed her clinging hands the charging waves come on fall off rise sheer as a wall and steep o oh christ must the whole dead world go down entombed in the charnel deep the strong tide lays her bosom bare she feels it dragging her tangled hair her hands have ceased to clasp and cling she has shaken her spirit free she will strive no more she will make no moan she will go with the clamoring sea the waves ring only against the rock 
but it feels as yielding beneath the shock and still the breakers lift their crests o oh, maiden mary she cries who will tell my lover my heart was true who will write me in love's eyes but the hydra heads have come and gone and in face of death she still lives on but they come no more dear god so nigh they come not again they fall and trample the rock beside her feet fierce monsters but held in thrall tamed in their very pride's excess to this turbulent show of humbleness the battle front of the dawned sea though the waves still chop and churn is in forced retreat the wavering tide has trembled long on the turn then one white wave came back and surged about her and her lips were purged and she lay there washed as for the grave and purer than virgin snow her beauty seemed as a conquering power in this its overthrow her eyes were blinded choked her breath her ears were open gates of death a panic seized on the routed waves they fled to the sandy shelves they writhed they foamed they broke they turned and foundered upon themselves but in that maiden was no stir great love had had his will of her the terror deepened upon the sea the stillness grew on the wind they fled together these fierce allies and left their spoil behind the one sole thing that glimmered white and pure in all that world of night part six two shapes passed over the sobbing sea to land at dunley bay one passed at sunrise one at noon of the new created day the first was a work of god undone the second a devil's but ill begun and both were silent as outer space both white as the upper air as one mask lay to the rising sun and one to the noonday bare broke from the first a gasping breath shone on the second the beads of death so the first was laid on the yellow sands to catch the coming of day and the second was covered up close as night to hide from the noon away and light of life came into the first but the second sweltered a thing accursed through the standing floods by the lonely ways and the tracks which the sheep had worn by shamish he of the bloody hands that spotless lady is born but her sleeping sense of his care is fain and his bloody hands leave never a stain he had sighted her soul when it rose and sued to his chief at her wild wide eyes and the sea and the shore through the livelong night had been ringing as with her cries and they drew him whether he would or no with the cords of a man and he had to go so he found her there where the sea had laid and left her but not a sound there breathed from her body as mournfully the waves fell sobbing round then a stainless lily alive or dead he gathered her up in his hands and fled then as bloody shamish was making the shore and laying that white lady in the sun's warm bed on the yellow sands maclean was putting to sea with the waxen shape that in hate of hell his limmer had molten and made so well but or ever the seeming widower had come with the seeming dead to dunley bay that first true twain were well on their journey sped been crocken behind them frowning above and blocking the way of the foes of love then they hail the fairy and lightly go where heavily erst she came and the jubilant song of glenara fell sets her frozen blood aflame and she lights at the gate and she seems to win her way like a chartered ghost within and she glides to her place by the heiress screen and she faces her kinsmen all for a wandering breath that told of her death had called them together in hall you must open your hearts as of yore to me for you get me back at the gift of the sea they opened their hearts and they lent their ears to her tale but on every dirk a hand was locked in a fast embrace and with promise of wilder work than ever had been in the age-long reign of hate twixt clan campbell and clan maclean then the women swarmed round her and bore her away as a leaf on the stream at flood they shrieked wild curses but eased their hearts with tears while they talked of blood and my lady who heard was resolving it all in the call of the cuckoo the song of the fall but when brave and sweet from her maiden bower she issued again they had done and the whole clan rose to the queen of the feast and she faced them and saw but one 
till her thought was drawn to that vanished shore by the ghost of the dirge of McCrimmon Moor. Faint as a travelling spirit of sound it came and went on the breeze, now low in the valley, now high on the hill, now lost in the leaves of the trees. But ever emerging and ever more near as men clutched their dirks and bent forward to hear, for they knew of the thing that was like to appear. A lie will be loud in its own defence, as a fearsome heart will be bold, and in every clockin the thing went through the lie had been told and told and the doom of the lady lamented o'er in the wild death-song of McCrimmon Moor. Now it wails, it shrieks, it is passing the cross, it has entered the gate and the beat, grows louder and louder the steady ground tone of an army of tramping feet. Then the great hall fills with a funeral train in weeds of mourning the false MacLean, steps warily close to an open bier with one downward fiery eye that is found a way through his folded plaid fast fixed on the waxen lie. Then he lifts his hand and he stops the march of the train in the favoring gloom of an arch. And one clan halts in the cavernous shade, one stands in a bright half-ring. By the torch-lit board each man in his place, but alert and ready to spring. If damnable treason for once overbore the bloodless craft of McCallum Moor, then from out the darkness a hollow voice comes deep as the gloom and dull, and the Campbells are fretting like hounds in leash, while the torturous lord of Maul pours the tale of his loss and his dole in their ears, while his false eyes verily shed false tears. Abide, my brothers, McCallum Moore has taken his sister's hand, and adown the hall in their Campbell pride they pace together and stand. In a halo of light by the open bier he waving a burning brand, In the false dead face which wears flat in the flare As the falser living shrinks back from the glare. But the lady has fronted the men of Argyle, And though never a sign gave she, Her heart on another's made silent call, And the twain were suddenly three, She holding inward with her maiden might The armed right hand of her own true knight. The mourner has turned in his ghastly fear from that deadlier image than death, and lo, on the topmost stair as of life sees the Lady Elizabeth, and the radiant vision had all but slain, as with affluent being that caitiff MacLean. His lieges are thronging in hall and court, and many bold men and true, but in view of that Lady who dazzles their eyes they cower and tremble too. Tis an unkinned sight, and a weird to see a spirit stand clear of its own body. Now MacLean lies bleeding and overthrown in his recreant haste to fly, but MacCallum Moore had foreseen his gain in the life of his false ally. Though his fiercer namesmen had all but broke from his cautious hold when his sister spoke. She spoke in her tolerant scorn. This chief has suffered some wrong of me, which failing to right, he went near to avenge, in the strength of his fear the sea. I stand here victor, let no man dare to take from the vanquished the life I spare. She seized the brand and tossed it alive on the waxen shape where it lay, and the full fed leaped up to the roof, and the night was a brighter day. Then Red MacLean, who dabbled with gore and abject with terror, fled out of the door to his whilom lady became no more. And she spoke again to her own true love, none hearing but only he. Forgive that a traitor in love's despite once dared in sight of the sea, but only once, high God, he knows, to touch the lips of me. Sith the great white wave that broke from above hath made them meet now for death or for love. Then she turned in her pride to her feudal lord, said, Brother, now give me shrift, I was offered to shame, I was offered to death, as I hold at the sea's free gift, my life and love I will hold them fast, or find me a grave with the true at last. But her brother has taken and joined their hands, and so soothfast was the kiss, so dear love's due to her lips so true she had like to have died of bliss. Then over her cheek as she drooped her head, love's banner at last, rose red, rose red. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of Selected Poetry on or about the MacLeans, compiled by John Patterson MacLean.